A breakthrough in the Syrian battlefield, further escalation of confrontation with the U.S. and smoldering tensions with Europe. 2017 left Russia with both triumphs and significant trials. As an active and indispensable player on the world stage, Russia is no stranger to critics and skeptics in its international engagement. As the curtain falls on the 2018 presidential election, is a new cycle of foreign policy on the horizon for the Russian Federation? How does Russia perceive the current international environment? And what are Russia's most important foreign policy directions in the next few years? I'm joined in Moscow by Andrei Kortonov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. Professor Kortonov, thank you very much for accepting our interview. I really want to start with the report that uh, your organization wrote out just recently that is called Russia's Foreign Policy Looking Toward 2018 and in that report it is said that Russia will see a new foreign policy cycle begin. At this new stage the country's partners and opponents both expect new ideas, concepts and opinions with regard to foreign policy as well as a revision of its accumulated experience. So what are we talking about with this new foreign policy cycle? Well, I think that uh, elections uh, in any country is an opportunity to turn the page and to start a new chapter. Mm, definitely, uh, this chapter is uh, a chapter in the same book, uh, so we do not expect or do not uh, foresee any radical deviations. Uh, from the current foreign policy mm -hmm. trends. However, definitely as time flies, uh, some ideas and some concepts have to be revisited. Uh, for instance? Uh, for, for instance, you know, we uh, have uh, to think about uh, what we're going to do in Syria. You know, suppose uh, the war is over, you know, how Russia is going to contribute to the post-conflict reconstruction of the country. It's a different ball game different partners, different actors, uh, has different uh, rules of engagement. One can also argue that uh, there are some pending problems inherited from the previous cycle. For example, we have a very serious problem with Ukraine and this uh, problem has to be addressed. If it is not addressed, uh, it's very difficult to imagine how our relations uh, with the West can get any better. Did you make any predictions uh, as, uh, for instance, for the situation of Syria? Um, did you foresee some scenarios unfolding in that year and how Russia should react or might react to these scenarios? Well, of course, uh, Syria uh, is uh, a place uh, where developments are very fast and the situation is very volatile. So we should keep in mind uh, a number of scenarios, some of them are more positive. We can think about uh, gradual termination of uh, hostile activities in this country mm -hmm. and a gradual transition to the political stage uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Syrian uh, reconciliation. Uh, but at the same time, unfortunately, we cannot uh, rule out uh, uh, a new aggravation of the situation uh, with uh, new conflicts. Uh, for example, a couple of months ago, it would be very difficult to imagine that uh, Turkey might clash with the United States in northern Syria. However, uh, this is what we see right now. Uh, definitely, that creates additional risks. Uh, a couple of months ago, probably, uh, we would not expect uh, Israel to be as actively engaged in the Syrian conflict as it is right now. So the situation is very dynamic. But uh, to be on the safe side, uh, what we need to do is to have a vision for the region, how we would like what is What is the vision for Russia then in 2018 for Middle East, for instance? Well, I think, and this is my personal view, mm -hmm. that uh, we should uh, gradually move uh, to a collective security system in the region, which will be inclusive. It means that uh, it will not be limited only to Arab states but uh, should also engage in this or that form a major non-Arab nations like Iran, for example, or Turkey uh, or Israel. Uh, this uh, uh, new system uh, should be based on uh, mutually agreed principles. Probably we can borrow something uh, from Europe, 
you know, this collective security system in Europe and the uh, OECE uh, for the Middle East, uh, which is not easy uh, mm. to put together, uh, but uh, uh, we need a kind of consensus between major players that uh, they will stop fueling the conflict. Do you think, given the current state of relations between the United States and Russia, uh, that vision is possible in the near future? Well, first of all, as far as the United States is concerned, I think the problem is that uh, I personally do not see a coherent U.S. policy in the region. I see a lot of improvisations. Uh, some of them are successful, some of them are not. I see a lot of rhetoric and uh, I see a lot of inertia uh, inherited from the Obama administration. And uh, unfortunately, we don't see a strategy behind uh, all these actions. However, speaking of uh, the Middle East, I think that the first goal uh, would be to reach some kind of understanding among major regional players, because the United States is important, of course, uh, but the regional players are players there. For them, it is uh, not only important, it is vital mm -hmm. uh, to reach an agreement. So uh, if I were to advise uh, uh, anyone on this issue, I would say, you know, first try to somehow reconcile uh, positions of uh, uh, countries like uh, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, which is, which is a daunting task. Sure, uh, but do you think the, the Middle East is more of a priority for Russia in, tw in 2018 than uh, the United States? Because you have spent more time elaborating on the Middle East situation. Do you think going into 2018 there will still be this disorientation in the U.S.-Russia policy that it's difficult for Russia to mm -hmm. react systematically? I think that uh, U.S.-Russia relations uh, are likely uh, to be uh, influenced uh, by the overall political environment, which is not good. And uh, in a way, uh, President Trump is boxed. Uh, Russia for President Trump is a toxic, uh, is a toxic asset. So we cannot expect much more than uh, tactical situational mm -hmm. collaboration. I wouldn't even say cooperation, but collaboration between Russia and the United States. And uh, we do have some positive experience in this collaboration. For example, if you take uh, Southwest Syria, the escalation efforts agreed upon by Russia, the United States, and Jordan, with some engagement from Israel, mm, these efforts are working more or less fine. We have uh, the monitoring center in Amman. Mm, we avoid uh, any kind of clashes. And uh, basically, the military on all the sides understand each other. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you know, I would be hesitant uh, to say that uh, uh, we can reach an agreement on strategic cooperation between Russia and the United States in the Middle East, uh, because definitely the interests, uh, uh, they might overlap, but they do not coincide. Right. And again, there are very many uncertainties about what the United States is trying to accomplish in the region. Looking from the current signs and all the things that are happening, uh, for instance, the nerve gas attack and all of that, do you foresee the situation going even further or further deteriorating in 2018 between Russia and the United States? I'm afraid <coughs> that it is likely. I think that um, the problem is that Russia has become an issue of the U.S. domestic politics. And uh, this is very difficult uh, to change. Maybe after the intermediate elections to the U.S. Congress, uh, we will see a different picture. Maybe the, the dust will settle down mm -hmm. and uh, there will be a consensus on how to proceed. But so far, mm, I think that uh, Russia remains a very serious irritant uh, for the United States. And, of course, uh, anti-Russian emotions uh, fly very high, not just in Washington, but elsewhere. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, I uh, cannot rule out uh, further deterioration of the relationship. In terms of Russia's relationship with, uh, the, European, with the European countries, the UK, Germany, France, um, is that a similar picture with uh, uh, Russia-US relations? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, there are similarities, but there are differences. Uh, if you take Europe, Europe is more important 
for Russia as an economic partner. It is closer, uh, the trade is much higher, mm, Europe is the major source of investment, major source of new technologies to Russia. Uh, and at the same time, Russia is more important uh, for the European Union. Again, you know, Russia is a major trading partner, it's a major supplier of energy. There are large Russian diasporas in many European countries. Uh, many people travel this way and mm -hmm. uh, the other way. Uh, so there are nuances, uh, and these are important nuances. And plus, uh, I think that uh, uh, the United States and Europe are now at uh, very different trajectories. And the United States has entered a very serious and arguably the most serious crisis uh, in its recent history. Uh, however, Europe, and namely the European Union, seems to demonstrate uh, a degree of resilience compared, let's say, with uh, 2016. Uh, yes, you know, they still have major problems. Uh, they have Brexit, uh, they have migrations, uh, they have financial issues mm -hmm. uh, to address. But at the same time, uh, elections in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in other countries uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, political center is still there and populists uh, did not really win. Uh, so I think that uh, the French-German axis will continue to be the backbone of the European Union and the European Union will continue uh, to operate. Uh, it will not fall apart uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So I think that uh, Russia is gradually shifting its attention from the United States uh, to Europe. But it's facing some strong headwinds, right, given the most recent uh, incident of uh, poisoning uh, of uh, the double agent. Uh, do you see Russia's relationship uh, turning in some new direction that uh, the European countries are collectively mm. uh, calling Russia into account for this incident? Well, uh, I think it's, uh, it is too premature to make final conclusions. Mm. Uh, definitely, uh, this is a major obstacle. And it's an unfortunate incident. I think it's an atrocious crime. And uh, whoever did it uh, should uh, pay a price for having done it. Uh, I just hope that uh, the Russian government has nothing to do with that. And uh, I would uh, argue that uh, it would be highly counterintuitive and counterproductive uh, for the Russian leadership to get involved in anything like that. I see no sense in, in doing that, even if we put aside all the moral considerations, which are also important, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, if you put it aside, uh, I think that uh, uh, there were some positive, uh, maybe very modest, but positive developments recently. For example, you know, President Macron mm, has uh, a plan uh, to come to Russia in late May. Uh, we might expect uh, uh, a Russian-German summit. Uh, there are many contacts uh, at various levels. So if I were to compare relations uh, between Russia and the European Union, on one forget, and the relations between Russia and the United States, on the other hand, I would still say that uh, probably we have uh, more opportunities in Europe than we have now in the United States. Uh, of course, uh, on certain issues, and some of them are very important issues, uh, the United States uh, is indispensable. You cannot handle no. the issue of North Korea with the European Union. You know, it is the United States uh, which plays a very important role here. Uh, if you uh, take uh, Syria again, maybe in future the European Union will be an important player, but not today. Uh, today it is the United States and the other countries uh, which are engaged in the conflict uh, uh, with uh, their military might. Uh, so uh, we will have to deal with the United States. But uh, at the same time, I think that uh, the European approach uh, might be somewhat more moderate. For example, if you take sanctions, you know, there is a big difference between the European sanctions against Russia and uh, the American sanctions against Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, the American sanctions are very general. They are about everything. They are about Ukraine and Syria and uh, elections hacking 
and about North Korea and about Iran and about human rights. So the assumption here is that no matter what Russia does, the U.S. sanctions will be in place. However, if you take the European sanctions, uh, uh, the European sanctions are very targeted. Uh, they are specifically linked uh, to the current situation in East Ukraine. And if the situation is to change, uh, then we can expect a change in sanctions. So there is a difference. Mm -hmm. What about China? What do, you, what do you see in 2018 for Russia in its relationship with China? And what will be the policy? Well, first of all, I think that we are on the right track in our relations with China. And last year was uh, a successful year uh, in terms of our trade relations, not just in terms of the uh, sheer volume, which grew substantially, uh, but uh, also in terms of diversifying uh, this trade. Uh, we saw, for example, Russia exporting much more food stock mm -hmm. to China than the year before. So we are gradually making this uh, relationship more diverse. I would also say that last year I saw many more Chinese tourists in this city than a year before. So this human dimension of the relationship, which is of course very important, uh, is also taken off gradually. Uh, however, I would say that uh, Russia and China uh, have a lot of problems uh, to look after. Uh, this year. And of course, uh, the most important uh, problem is uh, what will happen in North Korea. You know, they now say that there might be a U.S.-North Korean summit, but frankly, I'm not too optimistic about the ability of Donald Trump to resolve this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if this effort fails, we can see a new cycle of tensions uh, and uh, uh, new instabilities and even a danger of a direct uh, military clash between North Korea and the United States. And I think uh, China and Russia will have to do what they can in order to avoid a military confrontation. You have been watching a special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Moscow. We'll take a short break and stay with CGTN. Welcome back. You're watching a special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, here in Moscow. And I have been talking to Professor Andrei Kortanov, Director General of the Russia International Affairs Council. So we talked about uh, Russia's relationship with uh, the United States, Russia's relationship with China. Uh, now the United States has labeled Ch both China and Russia as uh, dangerous rivals to the United States, uh, whereas China China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi has most recently said that the relationship between China and the United States should not be one of a rival. It can be competition, but it needs to be a positive and healthy one. And then Wang Yi also says sky is the limit for the development uh, of bilateral relationship between China and Russia. So how do you look at this, this triangle of relationship going into 2018? What kind of shifts is going to happen? Or, or are we going to see the further... Um, polarization of uh, the different sides? Well, I hope that we will not see further polarization, but of course uh, there are risks there. And let me tell you that a year ago, when uh, Trump came to power, uh, I received many questions from my Chinese counterparts who said, well, you know, Trump seems to have a plan for Russia and he believes that China is the enemy and uh, are you going to stick to the United States? Uh, Will you abandon uh, your partnership with the Chinese? And of course I said, no, that's not possible. You know, we have a strategic partnership with China and it is more important than any other uh, bilateral relations that Russia is engaged in. Then, uh, in summer, after uh, the first uh, meetings between uh, uh, President Trump and Chairman Xi, uh, the perception was that uh, you know, it's, it's not bad in the U.S.-Chinese relationship, uh, they found some kind of uh, accommodation and relations between Russia and the United States went really sour. So uh, the table were reversed and now Russians started asking Chinese, you know, folks, you know, you have these uh, good relations with Washington, but uh, we hope that you will not abandon us. And now we see that uh, basically uh, both Russia and China are perceived uh, uh, as challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think that uh, there are still differences bet because Russia is perceived uh, primarily uh, as a kind of geopolitical uh, 
rival uh, or problem for the United States. And that implies, of course, uh, uh, the Russian uh, uh, policies in Ukraine mm -hmm. and in Syria. While China is still uh, primarily uh, an economic rival and uh, you know, no right. you know, threatens you know, trade wars and things like that. So it is still asymmetrical. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, both Russia and China will be able to uh, somehow keep you know, the, their relations with the United States under control. Looking for 2018 then, how do you see uh, President Putin striking a better balance between Russia's uh, geopolitical influence and diplomatic influence outside and the goal of achieving prosperity domestically? Uh, I think that uh, this is the critical question that uh, President Putin has in front of himself. Uh, Russia cannot rely only on its uh, outreach capacity. Uh, it cannot rely only on its military might or on uh, its uh, special status in the mm -hmm. United Nations Security Council. Uh, so uh, uh, the new cycle is also an opportunity to reconsider uh, some uh, of the fundamentals of the economic strategy. Uh, and right now, what we have uh, in this country is a lot of discussions, I would even say a lot of struggles about the direction of the economic development. Do we really need structural reforms? If so, what kind of reforms uh, uh, we uh, should uh, start with? What uh, are the social costs of these reforms? What is the most efficient way to fight uh, corruption? Mm -hmm. uh, how we should uh, get uh, to the post-industrial stage in our development? And uh, President Putin referred to some of these challenges uh, in his address to the Federal Assembly. For example, he spent a lot of time talking about digitalization uh, of the Russian economy. So I think that he understands the challenge, but uh, probably uh, we will know the answers only after uh, the election cycle when uh, he has the public mandate uh, to start uh, changing the Russian economy and to start serious uh, social transformation of the country. However, what we know is that uh, Russia has uh, uh, been putting a lot of uh, resources in the, in the upgrading of its uh, armed forces and especially uh, equipment as has been outlined by President Putin's State of the Nation address. Um, 3.7 times more modern equipment have been added to the armed forces and the naval. Although he said that this is only to defend Russia, it is def however the outside world has received his remarks with uh, uh, skepticism and doubts. So what do you think of Russia's, effect, Russia's military posture is going to affect its relationship with the world and in return uh, Russia itself? Well, first of all, you know, I have to mention that uh, mm. Russian defense expenditures right now go down, not up. They is it an intentional move or is it because of the economic situation? Well, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I think that there are certain economic pressures, definitely, uh, you know, there are limitations mm -hmm. on how much uh, the country might spend, but there is also uh, a military logic uh, uh, in the uh, modernization program. You know, this modernization program was uh, incepted, uh, uh, I think, eight or, or nine years ago, and it, it, it is also, it also has its own cycle. So we reached the peak, now we go down because uh, we do not need to invest uh, so much into the hardware. Uh, we need to probably do something about training, uh, about uh, exercises, about combat readiness, and uh, uh, this is uh, not going to be that capital uh, intensive. Uh, uh, but uh, having said that, uh, of course, uh, uh, I should also uh, state uh, that uh, what Russia has to do and uh, this is not easy, but it has to do it. It has to diversify uh, the set of foreign policy tools that it can use. Uh, because uh, as I think Mark Twain put it, if uh, the only instrument uh, you have in your hand is a hammer, then all the problems look like nails. Uh, so I think it is important uh, to uh, make sure 
that uh, Russia has a diverse set of foreign policy tools. Not only the hardware, not only the nuclear might, not only the uh, power projection capacity, uh, but also soft power uh, and uh, technology and uh, uh, economic accomplishments. Uh, uh, also, you know, Russian culture, uh, things like that. I think that we have underinvested uh, into this non-military, to sometimes, to, to a certain degree, even uh, uh, non-economic means of foreign policy. And we have to restore the balance, because this country uh, can offer a lot to the world. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, definitely we are underutilizing a part of our potential. So next to the military uh, resources, you're saying Russia also wants to build its soft power, its uh, um, cultural and art and... Absolutely, because uh, this is the currency of the 21st century. Uh, the military power uh, is important, uh, but uh, you, you cannot uh, overdo military power. Uh, I think that uh, it's not uh, an instrument uh, which you can use uh, with a high degree of flexibility. Uh, so if you take uh, you know, soft power, uh, it might be more efficient uh, and uh, it uh, uh, might not uh, cost as much as hard power. So we should explore opportunities that we have here. Mm -hmm. Finally, what is your observation of the surge of uh, populism and uh, uh, nationalism in different parts of the world and, and what do you think these sentiments are playing as a role in the interactions of major countries in the world? Well, I think that uh, this is a real trend uh, and I think uh, uh, it is arguably a natural reaction to the process of globalization because uh, when globalization started, uh, uh, and I'm old enough to remember these glorious days of uh, early globalization, you know, many people thought that that was uh, the panacea, that was something that will resolve all our problems. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives access, it uh, creates equity, it makes the world uh, more democratic, more predictable. We will all become one family and this is just great. And now it appears that uh, globalization does not come without a price. And sometimes uh, this price is very high. You know, people lose jobs, uh, people uh, lose their identities, uh, their uh, lifestyles are changing very fast and societies are not ready. Uh, so, you know, some people want to protect themselves against uh, this wave of globalization. Uh, they want to stick to traditions, uh, they want to stick to something they know, uh, they want to protect themselves against global markets, against uh, unpredictability which uh, often accompanies uh, globalization. Uh, so to some extent it is understandable, uh, but uh, you know, we cannot reverse uh, human history. Mm. The world uh, will continue to globalize, which means that uh, we should uh, find something that would give uh, globalization its human face. If we do that, uh, then uh, probably this current populism uh, and this um, nationalistic uh, trends uh, will gradually become uh, less uh, challenging and uh, less flamboyant and probably, you know, we will find the right balance, but it is not easy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kortanov, Director General of the Russia International Affairs Council. Thank you. And that is it for this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.